I'm going to begin a series over the summer entitled The Seven Churches of Revelation. The Seven Churches of Revelation. And my, my subject this morning is entitled Full Disclosure. Have you ever seen these commercials on TV and they tell you about some brand new medicine that's just phenomenal? Yeah. It's on the radio, it's on TV, but then they spend the next 30 seconds speed reading all the side effects. And, but it could also cause, yeah. <laughs> you know, so sometimes the side effect is worse than the actual thing that it's trying to help you with. But they need to, by law, disclose what's in it. Because if one of those other things happen, they say, see, I told you so. Now, yesterday I was invited to a gathering that's a once a month breakfast and I get this invitation every month. Sometimes I can go, sometimes I can't. And so I went yesterday, and it was an awesome meal. And I won a prize. In fact, I won two prizes, and that's because Sherry put in some raffle tickets for me, and they called my number. And so being the loving husband that I am, even though most of the gifts were directed towards Dad because it's Father's Day this month, the first one I got from my wife it was a big purple bucket and had purple mirror in it and a purple brush and shampoo and all kinds of foo-foo stuff that I wouldn't use. So I got it for her. Well, lo and behold, I got drawn again. So I figured, well, I'll get myself something this time. So this is what I drew. I got a, for, a forever LED flashlight. There you go. I got a bear. My grandkids or my dog will get that. And then I got some underarm deodorant, and I got some VO5 3-in-1 shampoo. Can never go wrong with either one of those. Those are always great gifts. But out of the interest of full disclosure, I want to read to you what's in this, the active ingredients. If I can, it's so micro small, i got to take my glasses off and bring it up to here. It says ingredients, water, sodium laureth, sulfate, sodium chloride, something betaine that I can't even pronounce, laurel glucide, fragrance, and then some other isoteraminodraf, ethyl dolomium, isosulfate, citric acid, Glycerin something rate, disodium, and on and on it goes. You need a degree in Latin and whatever else to read it. Here's one more. This is Ultramax Fresh Antiperspirant Deodorant. Now stop, Joseph, you already stole my thunder. Um, a number of years ago, studies came out that Sometimes, and we don't know for a fact, but it seems as if that sometimes dementia is attributable to the aluminum in underarm deodorant. So when I found that out, no, I, I believe it. I quit using an antiperspirant, and I used to use it all the time. So what I had to do is I had to find an organic, natural deodorant because I don't want to stink. I want to smell good. My mama taught me very, very well. She taught me social skills, and she taught me hygiene. Johnny, get in there. You wash your hands. You wash your face. You brush your teeth with, with toothpaste more than three seconds, and you, you put underarm deodorant on. When kids came around our household, if they stink like B.O., my mom would send them directly into our bathroom. She wasn't bashful one bit. Said, get in there, wash your underpits with soap and water, and put some deodorant on. My mom would ramrod the show. That's how she handled things. Now, this is Ultramax Arm & Hammer Advanced Sweat Control Fresh Antiperspirant Deodorant. Now, I really don't s smell bad anyway, but the honest reality is, how you have BO is not because you sweat. You have BO is because the sweat mixes with the dirt and it creates stink. Ah, this is a lesson now. That's how it gets there. It's not because that your pit sweat stinks. It's because of the dirt with the BO. I mean, the dirt with the sweat create BO. And so the active ingredients are some more butyl ether, some more of this <laughs> stuff I can't produce, Something alcohol, alkali benzoate, telic, hydro, hydrogenated castor oil, petroleum, fragrance, sodium biocarbonate, baking soda, um, cornstarch, how do you like that? Cornstarch modified, it says, and polysaturated uh, mal maltodextrin. Who wants some deodorant? 
Anybody want any deodorant? Here, Daniel, have some deodorant, will you, buddy? It's all yours. Good catch. I'll keep the uh, shampoo for myself. Full disclosure. No, there wasn't. That's good. Full disclosure. So I want to talk about that this morning, full disclosure in our message. Revelation chapter 1, begin at verse 1 through 20, is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John on the island of Patmos. It's written somewhere on the neighborhood of about 90 AD. Domination is the Roman ruler that's in power at this time. Persecution is in full swing. The Christians are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. It's written primarily to seven churches, which I'll describe a little bit later in a moment. And then it is written by the Apostle John. He's 90 years of age. The reason that he's on the island of Patmos is because they tried to. Do I get some of that pop now who popped the lid on that? Is that Pepsi, Coke, Sprite? Ah, you're right, I don't. Ginger ale, but that's it. That's as much as it gets. Whatever it takes. As long as you're awake, I'm happy. <laughs> and it's legal. <clears throat> so that's just a little bit of the background of what's going on and what's happening in the text. I was watching my message from a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about smoking pot. That's why I had to say that. <laughs> Throw that in there. Yeah, and that, just so you know, I don't smoke pot. I'm not an advocate of pot. No, why did I have to even go down that road? But anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't care what Oregon says. Whole other story. Let's stay on the subject, John. <laughs> so by way of introduction, are we able to get that up by any chance? If we don't have it, it's going to be fine. It was a really good outline, too, just so you know. Um, awesome PowerPoint. Great notes. Uh, but in my introduction, I did write this down. I said, the fledgling Christian assemblies of the seven Asian cities continually stood in jeopardy. Now, in fledgling, it's something, it's like, is it going to survive or not survive? That's what fledgling means. It's just getting started, and is this going to make it or not make it? The revelation provides a message of comfort and promise of the providential intervention of God in the affairs of man. God is concerned about you. He has not made you and then left you alone to fend for yourself. He's involved and interactive in your life, if you'll allow him to be. Triumphant vision and the promise of the ultimate defeat of the evil enabled these early Christians to encounter successfully the challenges that greeted them. So that's the background of where we want to enter into this story as we begin to develop Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 3. Here's what it says. And by the way, if you're writing and taking notes, point number one is the purpose. Everybody say the purpose. purpose. Look at everybody else and say the purpose or somebody else and say the purpose. So it says the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Now, soon take place didn't mean immediately. It really means once these things begin to unfold, they're going to happen in rapid succession. Some people take it to mean tomorrow. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about once they happen, they're going to be boom, 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 boom. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Note this, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Later on in Revelation chapter 19, we're not going to go through the whole book of Revelation, just so you know. I'm dealing with the seven churches, and that's my focal point through the summer. But in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when he says something, there's a prophetic element, nature to it. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Three major things that I want to teach on out of point number one. First of all is the word revelation. It's the Greek word apocalypsis. It means something hidden is now disclosed. And a definition for us in English is a word meaning unveiling or disclosure. That's why I read for you the ingredients, because by law, they have to describe the contents that is in this product that they're giving you. You then make a determination, is this good for me, or is this bad for me? Can I tell you, the revelation is a disclosure that I believe is good for every born-again believer and child of God. It's unveiling the mystery of what God is going to do in the end times. 
Theologians use a term, and it's called this. It means eschatology. Eschatology is simply defined this way, the study study of end-time events. Now, we are living in the end times. Jesus himself said that he was living in the end times. How much more so, 2,000 plus years later, are we now living in the end times? So this word revelation is key to our understanding of what God is trying to reveal to us. He's unfolding some things. Another thing is that he made it known to John by an angel. That means an angel came and interacted in, on the island of Patmos with John, more than likely in a vision or in a dream, as it communicates this to him. Okay? Now how John got there was interesting. In the fact that he is an apostle, an apostle of the Lamb, one who had seen Jesus, they tried to kill him, they tried to martyr him, which means to die for your faith, and they could not kill him by boiling him in oil. It was one of the means or the methodologies that they would use to, if you will, kill Christians, boil them in oil. Think of that for a moment. Recently I read in the paper that there was a guy who set himself on fire at the Washington uh, at the White House. I don't know if you saw that in the news or not. They show a guy with fire and everything else and he's walking. That a guy eventually succumbed from his wounds, did not, did not live. He died because of that. So they tried to boil him in oil, couldn't get the job done. They now exile him to the island of Patmos. Going on in the text, we see that it's to, to the, the angel. So this angel, the angel does not really come forward until we see uh, that about Revelation chapter 17, 1. So there's di- direct interaction between Jesus Christ and John himself, as we'll see in this first chapter. And then also the angel who is involved in the process of communicating to John the will of God or the revelation of God to John. We also see another word, and that's this found in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. Reads aloud. There is something about reading the word of God out loud. Okay? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's something about faith elevated how by reading out the living word of God. There are times in my life when I literally take the word of God, I open it up and I read it out loud. You want to know why I do that? Because I believe I am blessed when I do it according to this passage of scripture. That those who would read Revelation, even if you do not understand it, although the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, it says that there is a blessing on those that read aloud the words of this prophecy. I don't know about you, but I'll take every blessing that God has to give. In fact, the word blessing means spiritually happy from God's perspective. I want to be blessed to receive all that God has for me. And it says not only that, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So here again, not only is the one who reads it blessed, but also though who, those who listen to it are also blessed. Now, it's interesting because this letter is circular. That means, and I'll get to it in a moment, where there are seven churches and they are addressed in circular fashion. The church at Ephesus is the first church mentioned. It's really the epicenter. It becomes the mother church to the others, the other six around it. And this letter then would go out from Ephesus, which would be the home church, the mother church. It was the church, and then all those were planted from it. And it would go in a clockwise beginning in southwest motion and clockwise this letter would be circular it would be taken to each church and then read aloud now think about this for a moment there are how many chapters in the book of revelation 22 everybody say 22 Okay, that means that this would be set, rather, whether in one setting or multiple settings, I don't know, but this letter would be written as, wouldn't be written but would be read aloud in that church service And the people would be with rapt attention. Now today, if you were to do that, people would get bored out of their skull. You want to know why? Because we've been programmed. I grew up in the TV era. I'm a prod, I'm a baby boomer. Those that are born between 1946 and 1964, if you're born in that age span, you are a baby boomer. And you and I were raised on TV. It came into vogue, started out with black and white, started out with gun smoke, the Beverly Hillbillies, and, you know, all those, you know, Lawrence Welk, and, you know, um, I mean, on and on and on it goes. Come on, Gilligan's Island. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. Yes. See? Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, have a yabba-dabba-doo time. <laughs> Come on. 
all time. Yeah, so see, see, we were raised on that stuff. But what ends up happening, programmers are smart. They said, how we can pay for this is let's get advertisement for some VO5 shampoo to pay for their commercial on our program to generate income so that this program can happen. Of course, they're not going to read you all the ingredients in it, but they're going to sell their product. And then all the kids, yeah, soap operas, and then all the kids on Saturday morning, they would show a whole litany of cartoons. Okay. What are the cartoons from your era? Let me hear. Captain Kangaroo. Uh, the George Jetson. Jetsons. Meet the Jetsons. No, that's not. That's Flintstones. Uh, let's see Jetsons. Yeah. Come on, somebody. I, I'm conf- Jetson and his wife, daughter Judy, and their son Elroy. Is that right? Now we're getting there. Now we're getting somewhere. So all of those things are purposeful in programming. And then there would be Fruit Loops, and there'd be, uh, cr- uh, what's Captain Crunch? And there'd be, uh, come to the honeycomb hideout, honeycomb. There would be, I mean, I mean, I, I can remember these jingles to this day. Why? Because they're programming you. And what they also do is that they will show the cartoon for a period of time, and then boom, they're going to insert a 30-second and then a 60-second commercial to get you to want what they're advertising. In my day, it was, not for me, but for the ladies, it was Barbie dolls, and then it was kin to accommodate Barbie dolls, and all kinds of toys, and they would have Tonka. You remember Tonka trucks when they made trucks out of real metal and not plastic? Huh? Lincoln Logs, you remember those that you put together? And then there was the, the what's the uh, crafter set? What was the metal thing? What was that called? Erector set, thank you. So all of those things, they're purposeful to program you to purchase. Now, as time progressed, that time frame of commercials began to become more dramatic to pay for the airtime. And that within, what ends up happening is this whole generation is now programmed to think in, in, in seconds. So if your attention is not captured, you begin to wander off. You're thinking someplace else. That's why I say in that time frame, most of Americans would be bored out of their skull to sit and listen to a message. You wouldn't have cut it when Paul went to the church and he preached all night. Remember the story when he went and preached all night? Because he knew he wasn't going to be with them. It's found in the book of Acts. He rolls into town, he preaches, and he preaches all night, and he's preaching way into the middle of the night, and there's a guy by the name of Eutychus, or Eutychus, depending on how you want to pronounce it, and he's sitting in the upper story window, and the Bible tells me that Eutychus fell asleep, and he fell out of the window, fell down dead to the street. I'm telling you what, you don't want to go to sleep in a service, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> What ends up happening, they all run out. Oh, no, he's dead. They pick him up. Paul prays for him. The guy is raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Supernatural miracle of God. And Paul goes back up, and he serves communion on top of it all and keeps on preaching till daylight and then heads out of town. Most Americans couldn't cut it. Our service goes two hours, and that's long by most American services. Did you know that? Most American services are programmed to the minute. I don't want to badmouth anybody, but that is a reality. Much like a technological television production. I've been to churches where they literally have the sheet of programming and production, and we're going to do it this time, at this moment, at this moment, at this moment. You come in, you sing, we segue here. The lights come down, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da, and it's a dramatic presentation. All the power to you. But you better not, 86, and axe out the presence of the living God because you just became an entertainment center and not a place where God's spirit is free to move. Never would have cut it in Paul's day. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. By reading the word and listening to the word. Hearing what the word is saying. That revelation is being presented. Now, let me say something that may, maybe not, may not startle some of you. My uh, hermeneutics professor, Dr. Ted Roberts, went on, pastor of the Four Square in Gresham, Oregon, later became the leader of a very successful men's ministry nationwide, global-wide, uh, called Pure Desire. He and his wife led. They've now transitioned out of that. But Ted Roberts was my hermeneutics professor in Bible college. 
And Ted said, revelation has ceased. Illumination is really what's taking place now. In other words, revelation of the 66 books of the Old Testament. There's no more Bible being written. Did you know that? This is the revelation of God. But what the Holy Spirit then does, he takes that revelation and he illuminates it. So when you hear somebody say, hey, I got some hot new revelation. Come on, there ain't nothing new under the sun, bozo. I like what Helen said last week. So she could say bozo, so can I, can I? I wasn't naming any names. But sometimes it's like, ooh, I got this latest, coolest revelation. I'm telling you, it's been around ever since the Bible's been here. You just rediscovered something is what you did. But I understand the term in the sense that most people didn't get it. So I, I understand. I'm not putting anybody down. But I, I mean, if we want to get technical, right? Okay. So revelation just means something hidden is now disclosed. That's why the Apostle Paul says the mystery of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory, that Christ would come and die and be buried. That was a mystery until it's unveiled and it's unfolded. And now you know that mystery. It's revealed. Yeah. It was in counterdistinction to the mysterion, the mysterious re, the mysterious religions of that time frame that were like, ooh, way out there. That, 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 that this, was, this mystery is revealed. It's once hidden. It's now disclosed. It's open for all. Isn't it interesting, people? Like secrets. I want to be in on the secret. If you see two people off in the corner, David and Rod, and they're over there, and they're whispering, and they look over at you, and they keep looking at you and talk back. You're sure as shooting. They're talking about you. And they're not talking about you at all. They're talking about that great big fish that they had caught yesterday as they were out in the ocean or up at Odell and this giant Mackinac or this, this nice kokanee or something like that. It had nothing to do with you, but you're sure shooting that they're talking about you. No, 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 no. But we like secrets. But revelation is when that secret is exposed for all to see. And so the Lord's saying, man, I want to, I want to reveal myself to you. I want a revelation of what's going to come to pass and take place. That's the purpose of the book of Revelation as he's unfolding it to these seven churches. And by the way, there's discussion about the churches. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to stop and go to my next point because I'm going to get ahead of myself. So number one is the purpose, verses one through three. Number two is the author, verses four through eight. Let's read that and then talk about these churches. Verse four, John who is the Apostle John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, modern-day Turkey. Grace and peace, which is normal greeting. Grace would be the Greek greeting. Peace would be the, the Hebraic or the, the Israeli greeting. To you from him who, now watch this, is, who was, and is to come. That's who we serve. The God who was and is and is to come. He's all the above. Jesus Christ is. And from the seven spirits before his throne. Really, technically, it's the sevenfold spirit of God. God does not have seven spirits. If you look at your footnote, you'll see it's a quote from Daniel chapter uh, 7, verse 13, where Daniel also talks about the sevenfold spirit of God. That there are attributes of the spirit that seem like it's sevenfold. Okay? Now, going on in the text, it says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So put yourself in the position of one of these churches, Word and Spirit, International Church. John the Apostle is writing to you. This is who our God is that we serve. He was, he is, and he is to come. He's everything. He's freed us from our sins by his what? Blood. We celebrated it today in communion, that it was a symbolic uh, aspect of what Christ has done for us on Calvary's cross, and that we celebrate communion. And by the way, you're not limited to our church service to partake of communion. You could take communion every day of the week if you desire. You could take it at home once a week if you want. There is no limitation. Jesus said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Some church organizations will only do it twice a month because they treat it with such respect and reverence that they are very critical about it. Not critical in a bad way, but in terms of circumspect in their life, how they partake. 
I remember serving. I was at a pastor's gathering. There was a pastor from one such group that for him to take it monthly was like they would only take it twice a year. And then they would always foot wash. So I'm sitting there in this meeting. And he says, John, I would like to serve you communion. But in our tradition, we wash the feet of the people that we serve communion. Can I do that? You know how humiliating and humbling it is to have somebody wash your feet? I've had it done on a number of occasions, and I've, it's led me to tears because what it does, it exemplifies Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed, that when he came in to his disciples, before they sat down to the Last Supper, you remember where Da Vinci has all these guys sitting around at a table? It's not accurate. They would have been lounging around at the table because they laid down to eat. They didn't sit down like we did. But be that as it may, before they came in, walking the dusty road of Jerusalem of the time, they came in and their feet were dirty with dirt. And it reminds me when I was a little kid and I would run around and play outside in what we called thongs at that time. Now it's flip-flops. You got to clean it up because they have different meanings. How many of you were, these were thongs when you were a kid? Oh, don't say that now. They're flip-flops or they're slippers. Things have changed. <clears throat> But I remember running around in flip-flops as a kid and coming, and my feet were just dirty as crud. <coughs> and I'd put them in for a midweek washing in the tub, and crud and dirt everywhere. So think of that. Jesus is now. Here he is, the creator of the heavens and the universe, the sea and all that is in them. And his disciples come in before his crucifixion. And the night he was betrayed, he's going to eat with them one last time. And he kneels down and he washes every one of their feet. It's humiliating. It's humbling to you as one receiving. What a powerful statement. So this guy is washing my feet. And all these pastors, we're at Cannon Beach. It's a pastor's meeting for the pastors here in Eugene. And, and he begins to wash my feet. There's probably, I don't know, 75 pastors that are there and leaders. And it tears you up. It's a powerful statement on humility. We're not afraid to talk about the blood of Jesus. It's the price that was paid for our eternal life, our redemption. Hallelujah. So we see, number two, the author. He tells us who it is. It's John. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We call that a doxology comes from the Greek word doxa, where you begin to praise God. The Bible's filled, especially the New Testament throughout, with doxologies, doxas, little praises that come out. He says, to him be glory and power forever and ever. It's attributing God's glory. Verse 7, look, he's coming with the clouds. B is a quote from Zechariah 12.10, which talks about the literal return of Jesus Christ, the literal second coming. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. Look at footnote C there, which is <coughs> Zechariah. That is Zechariah 12.10. And it says, and so shall it be, amen. Then he says, again, talking about Christ, I am the Alpha and the Omega, which means beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So what we see is the author is John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he's communicating to us this revelation. So he writes first and foremost to the seven churches, but he's also writing to the churches today. Now, some have said eschatologically, which means the study of end-timed events, theologians say, well, these represent seven church ages, and that we're in, the, we're in the last stage. We're in the Laodicean age, and then the Lord's going to come. I don't buy that. I believe it's representative of the church in every age, that there are segments, these churches represent churches, plural, in every age whether it's the first century church or the 21st century of church, there are these kinds of churches that are represented that we're going to cover. So these seven churches were in the province of Asia and basically, which is in southwestern Turkey, these seven churches fit within a square 50 miles on each side. Boom, boom. So think of 50 miles. So take this. If we were to leave Eugene, <clears throat> drive to Salem, that's basically 50 miles. And then if you were to take from Eugene and go 25 that way or 25 that way, you'd be towards the coast and you'd be towards the Cascades. That's the perimeters of these seven churches, with Ephesus being the one that's the mother church. The others would be satellite 
or daughter churches from the church at Ephesus. Now, just historically and for context's sake, remember that the Apostle Paul established the church at Ephesus. In the book of Acts chapter 19, it says that he went there. And when he went there, he began to preach. And there were seven guys they had been taught by, <clears throat> by Priscilla and Aquila. And Paul says, have you received the Holy Spirit from when you first believed? And he says, we have not heard of such Holy Spirit. And he says, well, he then preached Christ to them. And he baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the oneness people say, well, see, we ought to baptize in Jesus' name only. No, it was to distinguish from John's baptism from, from Jewish baptism, which was proselyte baptism. That's why he did it. But the formula that Jesus did, everybody say Jesus gave, gave. is in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the formula. So when I take somebody down, I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And down we go, baby. And I believe in immersion. I want you all wet. I want you totally saturated. Why? Because it is symbolic of your death. Because you died to sin the moment that you got born again. It is really symbolic of your burial. That you have died to sin. And you're burying that sin. You don't want to bring sin back up, but that's your resurrection into a new life as a man or a woman of God or as a child of God, whatever your gender is. Hallelujah. That you come up, that it symbolizes that. And then it says that he then said, he laid hands on all seven of them, and all seven of them received the Holy Spirit, just like they did in Acts chapter 2, just like they did in Acts chapter 5, just like they did in Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' house, and they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then it says that for two and a half years, everybody say two and a half years. Look at your neighbor and say two and a half years. Look at your other neighbor and say you're getting a history lesson right now. That for two and a half years, Paul rented out the whole of Tyrannus. Now, I've been there to Ephesus. No, I haven't. I've been to Ephesus. What's the matter with me? Duh, 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 duh. I've been to Athens, but I've not been to Ephesus. Getting back to this story. Anyway, for two and a half years, he's at Ephesus. And for about four hours during this siesta time. So what they do, here's what I meant by that. In that culture and in that location and that, and that place, what they do in the Mediterranean, even to this day, is they come to work in the morning. They work till about noon. They go eat. They go sleep. They hang out. And they relax. And then they come back in the evening, open their stores back up. So about three to four hours, there's a break there. It's in that time that Paul the tent maker would then take people in the hall of Tyrannus. He rented a building, just like we're renting this building. And then he would teach people for that time frame in their siesta. And so for two and a half years, he taught them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He taught them the word of God. And he taught them about the kingdom of God. And he taught them the apostles' doctrine. That means the teaching the apostles taught. And the end result was this. It said that for two and a half years, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It says that even extraordinary miracles were done by the hands of Paul so that even aprons, really handkerchiefs that were used by him when he made his tent, or he made the tents and he sweat. Anybody ever sweat when you work? That when he was sweating and working. See, we sanitize everything. We make it like, well, praise God, I got my three-piece suit on and I'm on here and I'm preaching to these people. Paul would be tent making in the morning. He'd be teaching in the afternoon and then probably selling his tents in the evening. And when he made his tents, he sweated. And so he didn't go home and take a shower. He didn't jump in a bath. He went straight to the hall. He taught the people, sweaty and all, with his rags. And it says they picked them up and they took them and they laid them on sick people. And people that were demonized got delivered and the sick got made whole. And extraordinary miracles were done in Ephesus to the glory of God. So much so that it ticked off the silversmiths because it put them out of business. People stopped worshiping their false idols and their false gods. And they began to worship the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, they began to worship Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, the very same one that you and I worship, and it turned Asia upside down. I would to God, the same anointing would fall upon this location, this locale, and this United States of America. It's why we prayed today. It's why we interceded today that God would hear our prayer, rend the heavens, and come down. Hallelujah. That's what I pray for. That's what I believe for. The power of God to be unleashed in a location, in a place. It's to these seven churches that he is riding to. And they went from clockwise and went in a circle with the distribution of this letter. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you one more sub point out of point number two, and then I'll be done because I've run out of time. It's okay, isn't it? All right. He says it's from Jesus Christ. 
It's from Jesus Christ, whom we have received this letter. You see, this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of future events, although it is that. Really, it's more about a revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, before John describes end-timed events, he describes the Lord Jesus and reminds you of who he is. That's Jesus and what he has done. According to verse 5, which we read already, he is the faithful witness. That means he's a prophet. He is the first form, firstborn from the dead. Now he sits as our priest, our high priest, where he ever lives to make intercession on behalf of the saints. He is the ruler over the kings of the earth. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's prophet, priest, and king. He's all three. He's also our savior in verses 5 and 6. It was made his people a kingdom of priests. That's us. In Exodus 19, 1 through 6, it was his original intent for the nation of Israel. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 in the series that I did, it talked about in verse 9, you're a chosen generation, you're a royal priesthood. We must never forget that Jesus Christ shed his blood for us, that his blood cleanses us, it redeems us, and enables us to overcome. I have another point, but I'm done. I'm done. Preach myself happy. And I'm done. Full disclosure. <clears throat> the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to you and us and our children. Amen. 